Hi, I'm Gayla Scrivener, ex-corporate girl and now work-from-anywhere adventure seeker. Creating a work-from-anywhere lifestyle isn't without its challenges, but those challenges certainly don't overshadow all the many benefits. What breaks my heart is seeing folks stuck and unhappy in a career and lifestyle when they want more out of life. I believe that we all have the opportunity to create the life of our dreams and earn a living in fun and creative ways to make our dream lifestyle a reality. You too can experience wonderful adventure and freedom as you live life on your own terms. In this weekly podcast, I share experiences when it comes to growing a lifestyle business through guest interviews, content marketing experience and perspectives, virtual leadership lessons, and I'll even throw in some travel adventures. My hope is through all the interviews, the tips, advice, and personal experience, you'll be inspired and motivated to keep going and creating your dream lifestyle. Life's an adventure. There's no time but the present to live life to the fullest. Hi there and welcome to the show. I've got a question for you. Have you ever struggled with what to charge for your services? Maybe you've been worried about not getting the job so that you want to give that potential client the lowest price possible. Maybe you get some pushback on what you charge. Oh my, I have to be honest with you. For me, having that pricing conversation has not traditionally been my favorite thing to do. I feel awkward with the whole thing, but now over time, it's gotten to be better with experience. Now, if you struggle with pricing your services and feeling like you're never getting ahead, then this is most definitely the episode for you. I've asked pricing expert Paul Klein of the Pricing is Positioning podcast to join me and discuss how we should be pricing our expertise in the marketplace. Paul is a business consultant and entrepreneur. From his days as a 1980s hairband guitarist, he has been a lifelong entrepreneur. He has experience starting and scaling a successful SaaS company, as well as consulting some of the biggest brands, including Target, Neiman Marcus, Starbucks, Holiday Inn, and other global brands. Paul helps consultants, freelancers, and solopreneurs price their services and to stop undercharging so they can build their seven plus figure businesses. I'm a big fan of Paul's podcast, and I'm super excited for you to meet him. So let's hop right into the interview, shall we? Well, hi there, Paul. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here, Gayla. I am super excited for my audience to get to know you because I've been a following you or internet stalking you for, for a while now, <laughs> and I'm, I'm a big fan uh, of yours and am so happy that you're on my show. So before we get started, I would love for you to tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Oh no, these yeah. are always fun. But um, first off, I'm honored that you uh, you tune into uh, to the show and uh, and and have you as a listener. But I'm more honored to be here and and help your audience. And uh, that's that's what this is all about and what um, what my journey's been. And I started um, many years ago, much like you. I was in the corporate world for se- you know several years, six figure job health benefits. All I had to do was cruise. I was 40 years old. This was in 2009. And all I had to do was cruise to 55, get my retirement and all that stuff. If you think about back in 2009, it was right after Obama started the presidency and Bush left the uh, financial crisis, the, the, the Dow dived down and, and it was the worst time to be going in business. And so, I was working on the side and kind of doing my side hustle and, and consulting and so forth. My wife knew I was miserable and she finally got tired and said, you know what? Just quit, quit your, your job. I mean, my company was doing really well. It was ready to take off and she's all, just don't tell me when you do it. And so what happened is after about, uh, I don't know, several months of just kind of doing both things, it came to that point where I I made the decision. And so one weekend she's all, Hey Paul, uh, on Monday, can you pick up the kids and, uh, and go get, I've got a doctor's appointment or something. And I go, can you get off work early? I go, well, I don't, I don't have work anymore. She's all, no, (laughs) you did it. Didn't you? 
And uh, so that was the birth of my consulting and entrepreneurship. And I was a, I was an entrepreneur stuck in a bureau, corporate bureaucracy. And uh, I unleashed in 09 and started my first consulting business. Since then, I've launched three other businesses. Uh, the consulting business took off really well. I work with Neiman Marcus, uh, Taco Bell, Yum Brands, a lot of restaurants, Cracker Barrel, a lot of my clients, uh, Starbucks, as well as retail, JC Penney's, Target. Uh, you name them, I probably worked with them. So that's what I do in my consulting side. And then um, started a SaaS company in 16 that I'm still part of or, or part ownership in. And uh, that'll run the day-to-day operations. I'm more of like an investor advisor in that. And then I have my personal brand, which uh, you know me for and uh, at paulkline.net. And I have my podcast called Pricing is Positioning. And I help freelancers, consultants, solopreneurs stop undercharging and devaluing themselves and find their true value and help them go up that ladder of value from five, six to seven figures as a consultant in their business. I really enjoy uh, helping people do that and seeing them succeed. Awesome. Yeah, that's how I got to know you. I saw one of your presentations about pricing and I was blown away. And I love your podcast. I would love for you to explain to my listeners, what is pricing positioning? What, what yeah. is that concept? Yeah, the the uh, I actually stole the name from uh, one of my virtual mentors, uh, Blair Ends. He has a book called Pricing Creativity. I highly recommend it. I don't have a book, but Blair's Blair's one of the pricing gurus in this space. He works mostly with corporate uh, agency types, but in his book, he had a term in there called pricing is positioning. I said, I was looking for a, I, I loved pricing. I'd studied all the books from Alan Weiss to Ron Baker to Blair and Jonathan Stark and so forth. And I just said, that's the name of my podcast. And the, and the reason why it resonates with me and, and my audience and, and the people I coach and work with is, is because so often we commoditize ourselves, our products, our services. We take our expertise for granted and we don't it comes easy to us. Therefore, we devalue it. So then when we are on the negotiation table with somebody, we think, oh, you know, I can knock out that email sequence or I can do that marketing campaign or, or whatever uh, because it comes easy to us. And so, you know, you, you end up commoditizing your, your pricing. And so what I say is, you know, pricing is positioning. It positions you uh, in the marketplace. You know, you're, you're not going to expect to pay, you know, $5,000 for a Tesla. Tesla is a premier brand, you know, or a, a blouse at a Neiman Marcus versus a Walmart. You know, it's just the, the, the pricing, the quality may not be any different. I'm wearing an Under Armour shirt, you know, and it's just a basic polo. Uh, but you put the Under Armour logo, logo or Nike on there, it now has a, a better value. So pricing is one piece of that. You've got to have your pricing, your value proposition, and your positioning, all three of those things working together, which helps you get those higher rates and, and great, greater value in the marketplace for your products and services. Our society is steeped, steeped deep in hourly wages. Mm. <laughs> and I, th- I know because I've experienced it myself is that's where you start out as a freelancer is, is hourly. And then you, you try to price to be affordable to get your first clients, but there's like no margin. And there's mm. the expectation that, well, I can hire somebody else. Well, you're an independent contractor. You, you price differently than, right. But that hourly, I, me, myself, my mindset is that it's hard to leave that steeped, ingrained. Yes. yes. Because everyone, now, I, when I feel like I've made some progress, everyone around is just like always asking, what's your hourly rate? What's your hourly rate? <laughs> I am sure I am not alone. <laughs> How? Yes. I know that there's value-based pricing. So how can you help like overcome <laughs> this mindset? I mean, it's so hard. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I totally, totally get it. And I want you to join a revolution with me. And that is we've got to abolish and get rid of hourly billing. It is the most antiquated way to do business in the knowledge economy. I mean, we are all, especially now with COVID, we're working from home. We're basically all consultants, <laughs> you right. know, uh, you know, you can, you can work part-time for two different companies and, and no one would probably know, you know, you think about hourly billing was developed over 200 years ago by the legal profession and then eventually adopted into other professions, especially in the, the industrial, industrial 
stage. And so, yeah, yeah it, it really, you know, became clock in, clock out and so forth. And, and it hasn't, hourly billing hasn't changed to this day. It's still entrenched in our society. But do you think, do you think our society's changed since then? Do you think our professions have changed since then? Absolutely. And so the quicker, if you don't take anything away from this conversation today, if you can just get away from hourly billing and when people ask you, you know, when they ask me, what is your hourly rate? I say, I don't have one. And they're all like, what? And they're perplexed. But once I have a conversation, I automatically shift the conversation to value. And it's because people really want outcomes. You know, they, they, they want to pay you for outcomes, not time. They want the result, you know, it, whatever the pain is that your product or service will solve, they want that done and they want it done quickly. So, and some people will pay a more premium uh, price. I mean, you'll pay double the flight cost to get a direct flight from New York to LA versus have to take two jumpers. You know, that has a higher, higher value. And so, it, you know, when you can solve that pain quicker, people want the outcome. And when people say, well, if you don't have an hourly rate, what, how do you charge? And you can have that conversation where you, you know, have other pricing arrangements. And I, I talk about five different pricing arrangements. The first one is hourly. That one's antiquated. You want to get rid of that one. The second one is having what I call a daily rate. And that's just a flat rate for, you know, for you to work on their project, consult with them, uh, whatever it is. Uh, and it's typically more of like an on-site kind of arrangement where you're maybe flying out to the client or something. Maybe a client um, hires you to come in and do an email campaign or marketing campaign. You come in, you have a daily rate for that. And whether you're there for an hour or 10 hours, it's the same rate. It's not tied to time. It's tied, it's tied to your, you know, to your expertise for that. And then the other um, one that I really love is called what I call, it's not what I call, but it's um, what everybody might have heard of. It's called a retainer. But it's not a retainer in terms of like how the legal, the legal profession right. still does it. Yeah, right. they'll, they'll put, you'll put an attorney on a retainer and then you call them for a two minute phone call. They bill you for 15 minutes against that retainer. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what's called a retainer for access. Okay. And what it is, is your clients are paying you for your expertise and access to that expertise. So what I work do with my clients is they'll, they'll engage with me on a retainer and then now they're a priority. So if, when the email comes in from one of my retainer clients, phone call, those go to the top of the pile. They, they're, they're, they're priority clients. They, you know, they're like my first class clients. I have other clients that are part of my programs and so forth that may not, you know, that aren't in, in as a, you know, they're like in, they're in a business class or not business class, but uh, whatever it is, the middle, the middle one. And then there's the ones that don't pay anything. They're just, you know, they just email you for, for your expertise. Well, that gets way down on the, on the totem pole. But the whole idea is having a retainer for access. It's a great way to balance out the highs and lows of your projects. So when you use retainers with your projects, um, it can really help ride out those highs and lows between big projects. And then that's the next one is projects. You know, that's just your basic project. Okay, you want a marketing campaign, a web design, uh, whatever it might be. Here's the, here's, here's the project. It starts on this date, ends on this date, and it's $10,000. Boom, that's a project. And those are, that's another great way uh, to charge for your services without, you know, doing hourly. And then the last one is what we call outcome-based or value-based pricing. And so value-based pricing is very much entrenched in, the whole idea of, um, you know, there's, there's books on million dollar consulting, uh, value-based pricing by Ron Baker is a great one. But the idea is, let's say you have a client that has, you know, $500,000 in annual revenues, okay? And then your product or solution can either provide that, that client an additional $200,000 in gains, revenue gains, or cost savings. Doesn't matter. It can be cost savings. That's still a, that's still a gain on the net sheet, right? So now your price is based on that net gain. So your price isn't just a flat rate of say $10,000. Their win, their outcome is that 200. So your price is closer to the $200,000. So it's a percentage of the ups uh, basically is, is how that works. So again, $500,000 client, you added another additional $200,000 in annual revenues with your solution. Now your, your fee is based on the a percentage of that ups or those gains. That's, you know, that's, that's a simple, <laughs> a simple two second version of uh, value-based pricing. But those are all great models that I talk about and teach uh, and help you get away from hourly billing because hourly billing automatically puts you at odds with your clients. They want you to get it done as quickly as possible. 
you want it to drag out longer because you're going to make more money and it, but you know, you have, you have competing um, uh, objectives uh, where the others you're, you're in line with the client. The client doesn't care. They want that outcome and that uh, result is what they're really paying for. If you're so steeped in hourly, do you have any advice on making steps toward more either retainer or value-based? How do you yeah. calculate? I mean, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That way? First thing you do is, is even if you in the back of your mind are charging hourly or figuring out your bids hourly, don't have that conversation with your clients. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first step is say, let's say I, I have a project and I normally charge 10 hours at $150 an hour or I'm trying to get to an easy math, $1,500. The project's $1,500, yeah. okay? okay? And I back into that by taking my time, times in it by an hourly rate, 10 times 150, $1,500. Instead of telling the client that and breaking that down on your invoice and so forth, get rid of that methodology in conversation with your client. Say, yeah, my uh, fee for this type of project is, is $1,500, and you know you'll get x y and z and then they don't even get in you don't even get into that conversation with the client without now in the back of your mind you may use that as a barometer and that'll that'll slowly move you into the project more of project uh, calculation base and the next question comes up well what happens if i do it for 1500 and then they ask for something else that you know it's going to cost me another 5 hours or 10 hours of work well that's where you've got to you got to be real clear on your scope and have very specific deliverables and, and so forth. So, it, this gets you X, Y, and Z. If you want A, B, and C, that's an additional fee. That's another $500 or something like that. And you're not, again, you're not tying it to time or an hourly rate. You're just, you're just charging flat rates for those deliverables. And that's the first step in, in getting away from hourly. And once you do that, the light bulb will come on and you'll realize you start having these conversations with the clients. Uh, it's like, wow, they don't really care about the time. They don't, all they care is about the result. Now I can charge $2,500, wrap some of those same deliverables in, parse it out to somebody else. Now I've made $1,500. The client's happy. My, my uh, subconsultant's happy and, and I'm making money now and, and I'm not uh, sitting there trying to figure out how to charge $150 an hour for, you know, for a bunch of busy work. Right. Slowly but surely, I think, because I've had conversations that it's like, oh, this is outside of the scope. We need to mm -hmm. do something different. And being more clear but it it sometimes it's a difficult thing because it's like you're a people pleaser you just want to help and then but there's consequences and Scope i have, creep yes and i have figured out or pleasantly surprised that when shifting to more of a value-based or you know retainer the way that you define mm -hmm. retainer because that's a big difference that was like a yeah. huge light bulb that that went off when i started doing that it's like i have more margins because yes what do you do when you are asked to think on behalf of your client i mean you don't clock that if you're a writer you just kind of like huh i'm not actually at the typewriter right <laughs> typewriter i said typewriter <laughs> <laughs> nobody, keyboard. I know what you mean. Nobody knows what a typewriter is. Um, yeah. But you sit there and, and you're not physically writing, but you're thinking. And most, right. most folks ha are thinking outside of and, and putting things together are the problem solvers on behalf of their clients. That yeah. That and that, that's such an important point, Gayla, because that's where we are. We're in the knowledge economy, the expertise based business. And so if we stick to that hourly billing model and you're working with a client and you did your four hours for the day, you know, you, you worked on their project from eight to 12, took lunch. Now you're working on another project. Then at six o'clock that night, you're sitting there watching a movie with your husband or whatever. And all of a sudden, oh man, that would be a, you see an ad on TV and all of a sudden that, that would be a great idea, but I can twist it to fit this brand. And you just spent 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes thinking about that subconsciously or just as you're, you're you know, maybe washing dishes, whatever it is. Now, are you supposed to bill for that 30 minutes now that you just solved uh, that problem for that, for that client? No, that's because that's what comes to you. And that's, that's, that's being paid for your expertise and not by the hour and, and shifting that from, Hey, I'll, 
whether it takes me 15 minutes or 150 hours, it doesn't matter. You're paying me for that expertise. I've cut my teeth in this uh, industry or vertical for many years to be able to do that quickly. And I shouldn't be, you shouldn't be penalizing as, as, as an expert for being good at what you do. You should be rewarded. <laughs> yes. Now you said a word about anchoring. What does yes. anchoring mean? Yeah, price anchoring. Uh, This is derived in what's called behavioral economics. There's been several studies that have proven this. And the basics of it is in a nutshell is that the in any kind of pricing negotiation or anytime you're working with a client and you're trying to negotiate a price, the first price you see or hear anchors the value in the conversation. So what I recommend you do is throw anchor bombs. I call them anchor bombs often and frequently when you're in the negotiation. So most people will say, you know, when I'm negotiating a project or a contract, the traditional thinking is I don't want to say a price because um, it might be lower than it's like buying a car or something. You know, you go, I don't want to say a price because what I'm thinking might be low, lower than what they're thinking. And they, you know, and so everybody holds back and says, you know, doesn't want to, doesn't want to divulge a price. So, what you do is you, you anchor that you, you, and you anchor high, you know, so it can anchoring will also happen even, even when people are aware that it's being done to them. Like I, in my workshops, what I do is I usually have a, uh, 12 people in my workshop and what I'll do is I'll, I'll divide them into two groups, six and six group A and group B. And I'll ask group and I'll tell them, Hey, we're going to do an anchoring exercise. And what I'll do is I'll say, Okay, group A, um, here's a question for you. And, and that question will just simply be, what do you think the uh, average hourly rate of all the consultants in this room uh, is? And then they'll all fill in the blank, you know, $150 an hour, whatever it is. And, and, they'll, and then what I'll do is I'll tally that group A up into a, a rate. Then group B, what I'll do is I'll anchor them. I'll say, do you think the hourly rate of all the consultants in this room is, is greater than $500 or lower than $500 per hour? And inevitably, group B is always higher on average than group A that it was not anchored. And so, what I do is uh, when I'm on a phone uh, call with a, with a prospect, I'll, I'll say, yeah, this sounds like a great project. I really think we could work together. Uh, it's going to be in the you know, $15,000 range. And you just go silent and let them flop on the floor and foam at the mouth or, okay, send a proposal over. Boom. Now you know where you're at. And what I do when that first number I drop in that conversation is a high anchor. So my, in my mind, when I'm talking to uh, to the prospect, it might be, it might be closer to, you know, 10, nine, $8,000, but I'll anchor up, uh, up a lot higher than where I think I need to be. Uh, And then what'll happen is I'll get a gauge for the client and I can kind of gauge, you know, and then based on their feedback after that, I can go then and craft my proposal um, uh, via email to them. I'll also do it in my email. And the other thing companion to anchoring is always providing three pricing options. You know, you see this all the time. It's, it's pricing psychology. All the big brands use it. Uh, you see it at Starbucks. You see it at the car wash. There's the premium, the deluxe, and the super deluxe or whatever. You know, the, yes. the $7, the $12, and the, the $18. You know, so you, you do that with your, um, in the consulting freelance world as well. And that is uh, after I've, I've dropped that $15,000 anchor bomb on the phone and they, they say, yeah, send me a proposal over. Then I'll send over a one-page proposal with three pricing options. The high end being at that 15 with lot lots of deliverables, you know, expedited service, priority client. Then I'll have a middle option that's kind of somewhere in the middle where I, they, I think they might be. And then I'll have like a low bare bones option. And inevitably, they'll, on average, they'll pick that middle option. And so that's um, anchoring with price options working together to really help you um, empower your clients to make the best decision for them. Because giving them a single price option is like giving them an ultimatum, a take it or leave it. When we hire a contractor, we get three contractors, get three prices. Well, if the first contractor would just give three pricing options, he'd probably get the job. So that's kind of anchoring and, um, and using price options together to really position your, um, your proposals and your, um, your bids together uh, work well, well. Well, that's just interesting that you just brought up that like a contractor, they do traditionally give one bid. One that- price. That would really rev- revolutionize if they say you can get the souped up, you know, yeah. this is the high grade, middle grade, and this is not low grade, but this is the bare bones service. Yeah, you got, it's, 
It's called uh, Goldilocks pricing, good, better, best. Okay. So if the contract, the first contractor would come to you and say, okay, here's my, here's my good, better and best price. What'll happen now is the, is your client will say, not if I'm going to work with Gala, but how I'm going to work with her. That's how it shifts in their mind. So now I've got, I've got, a, I've got a, an equation uh, puzzle. I have to, my mind has to come um, to, to solve here. It's, it's again, based in behavioral economics. And now I've got to figure out which one of these, which one of these bids is best. So now I'm comparing Gala's price, three pricing options to Gala. And I'm not concentrating on going and getting another contract or another bid now. Whereas if you had given them a single price option, they might've went and got two more bids just to do it. But now when you do that for them, boom, it really changes the equation. I've had a lot of success with that. And um, I know many people that have. I have a lot of friends that are contractors and that's so traditional to have one bid. And then they're like, oh, I've got to underbid XYZ over there so I can get the job. But then the more underbidding that they do. They just shooting themselves all oh, down. There's no margin. And no margin. This, uh, that idea for shifting even and, and trying it. You know, what they should do is have that bare bones. I got to get the job price. And you can do this in, in your business, whether you're a contractor or a knowledge-based worker or consultant, have that bare bones. I got to get the job price, but throw in that next option that has more access to you. Uh, weekly meetings, um, you know, there's other value adds, guarantees, you know, hey, I'll guarantee this work more than if you pick that lower option or quicker turnaround times. That's what I do a lot. And then my high option, man, that's the, that's first class. You know, that's your, you're getting everything. Let's um, go to you know, lunch together. Let's, yeah. uh, let's be friends. <laughs> Exactly. So contractors could do the same thing. This is gold plated nails, you know, uh, supreme concrete, whatever it is, you know, you can add all those uh, value adds to that high option. And then uh, you'll be surprised on average, 80% of the time, roughly they'll pick that middle option. Even when you think they're going to take that really low bare bones, I got to get the job option. One thing that I learned from you and one of your presentations that I had seen is the one page proposal. I had been taught or had read and had gotten advice that these proposals are so deep and uh, ridiculous. Ridiculous. <laughs> and I've been experimenting and working with your one page proposal formula. Can you tell the audience a little bit about? about that? I mean, versus yeah. grueling 10 page type thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this has, we could go real deep here, but, but, but it's, it's really simple. You think about it right now as a society right now, people who are hiring you, we're distracted. We're making over 3000 decisions a day, digitally, email, text, social media, phone calls. I mean, our brains are overloaded. And when you throw a 10 page proposal with all your, your fancy graphics and all these projects you worked on, they don't care about that. They flip right to the end and look at the pricing sheet. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is you want to make it easy for your prospects to work with you. So first off, you'll stand out from everybody else because everybody else is doing five, 10 page proposals. Second thing, you throw in a one page proposal, that's super simple bullet points. Here's what you get. If you can't fit it on one page, page, get rid of it or reword it. And then with your three pricing options and, and, and just send that in and, and then save all the detail, the qualifiers, the legal jargon and all that crud for the contract. Once you get the job, if you throw all that in your proposal, it's just muddling up all the the, the, it's, it's, it's confusing them. And then they're getting what's called choice overload. There was a jelly study or a jam study in the Bay area many years ago where uh, the retail store would put out 21 jams and it was, I, I should know this. I used to have it committed to memory. I can't remember. It was like 70% uh, um, wouldn't buy when there was 21 jams. Well, when they put down six jams, it like went up 60, 70%. Uh, buy, buying because people would see 21 jams and go, uh, I don't know what to do. So what happens when we're confused? We, we get what's called choice overload and we don't act or we go to another path. It drives, it drives the, the prospect to your clients. And if they have a one page proposal, it's super simple. Hey, here's what you get. Here's what it costs. This is the result. Boom. They're going to, they're going to pick that all day because it's simple. It's easy. And we don't have time to 
on a daily basis, your prospects don't have time to just, you know, they don't need to dig. They don't want to dig. They want to make it simple and easy to engage with you. Once they're, you have them on the hook, then throw all that other stuff in there in the contract. I, I love that. And that has been really successful for me. And are, is there a time that it's a good idea to publish your, I mean, you see SaaS companies all the time because it's appropriate. These are my, my low, middle, and high ranges. And you click on the button, you get that service and, and everything like that. But for uh, freelancers, coaches, consultants, is it a good idea to uh, put your price right there on your website? I think it depends on a couple things. One is, is if what type of service is it? If it's a productized service, meaning it doesn't take, it's like a package, it's, it's a software, it's something that they just buy, an online course that they just buy and it's kind of automated and it, and it doesn't involve your personal touch. You know, it's, it's, it's that whole passive income model. You know, you, do, you, you spend a bunch of time building something and then it, it can be sold you know, it's a one-to-many relationship. So, those are what we call productized services. For those, yeah, you've, you've got to have that. And and when you do, I still recommend the good, better, best pricing or the three options even in that. Now, for your high-end consulting, your done-for-you projects, your, you know, your, your high-end consulting where you want to be that higher tier consultant or freelancer, I don't recommend you put your pricing on there it, it, for two reasons. One is it commoditizes you. And, and, uh, and devalues you. And then, and then people can just compare you to something, uh, you know, to somebody else. I got this from Blair Hands, and it's, it's price the client, not your service. And the reason why is because you don't want to, um, you know, if you get a call from a mom and pop flower shop wanting a web page, that's totally different than a Nike calls, you know? And so if you have a $15,000 web package, you know, all of a sudden you get a call from, and it doesn't have to be Nike, I'm using a very extreme, but maybe it's a local business owner that has, you know, 25 locations of restaurants that wants new ordering and iPad integration and so forth. If you have a, a $15,000 package, that's not going to work. So, you know, that's your high-end consulting. You want to guard that. Now, if you're inundated with tons of work and you are just you don't have any margin and you, and you're, and you're, you want to turn clients away, then you can put what's called a minimum level of engagement on your webpage to get rid of the bottom feeders, the tire kickers. So if, if right now you're so busy with your project work that you wouldn't take a job less than $5,000, then put that on the webpage. So that way you don't get a bunch of calls from people wanting $500 jobs, you know? So it, it kind of depends on, on you, but um, you know, definitely productized services are okay. And if you want to weed off bottom kicker, tire kickers and, and, bottom feeders because you're so busy. But in general, I recommend you don't, especially for your high-end consulting and project work. You have a lot of resources that you have read or that you use, but out of all the resources or books that you've read, is there one that bubbles up to the top that's really made a difference to you for professionally? <laughs> you know, uh, it, I think it depends on what season. If you would have asked me a few years ago or several years ago, one of my favorite books is Rabbi Lappin's Thou Shall Prosper. You know, especially if you're, you're um, a person of faith and you struggle with charging more or, mm-hmm. you know, that you feel icky about making a profit because, you know, you and I grew up from the late 60s and the 70s and 80s and all the old 70s and 80s shows were the evil businessman taking advantage of the little man, you know, and yes. Tommy Boy, remember Tommy Boy had yes. to save, uh, save the company from the evil uh, Dan Aykroyd. And so there's that negative connotation. And in Rabbi Lappin's book, he dispels that. And it's from a spiritual point. I mean, he's a rabbi, you know, mm-hmm. come on. So, so it's a great perspective on how our society, a capitalist society works together in creating, what, you know, a win-win, you know, Someone needs your service. They, they need your service and it's perfectly acceptable to be well paid for that. It's called certificates of appreciation or dollars. You know, so you created a beautiful web page or lead magnet or email campaign for me. That's worth good money and it's an even exchange of value and we both win in that, that, that case. So that really helps you get over that mindset of, of being icky, making a profit and so forth, especially for people of faith. And then the, I got to throw the second book cause I just, I, I reread it again recently and it, it just, it woke me up and um, really opened my mind again. It's just a great book. It's some, it's like think and go rich and those kinds of mm-hmm. books. And that I was telling you about it before we got on here and that is the magic of thinking big. 
And uh, it's the same idea in terms of, you know, getting over your mindset and just, just helping with mindset, you know, with, with achieving your business goals and so forth. And uh, so those are my two, two books that uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just going through uh, Magic of Thinking Big uh, for the third time. So that's a, that's a great one. Nice. I'll have links in the show notes for all of those. And I had an idea that I was going, and by the time that this podcast publishes, I was going to, on my resource page, I want to share and I'd like a nice gallery of all these great and wonderful resources that my guests uh, share with us because I'm, I'm kind of on a mission this year for reading more and I'm only picking up the books that my, my guests suggest and it has opened up my world. Uh, yes. Sometimes we, oh, sometimes we just get into a, a rut or uh, blinders on and mm-hmm. we are in the weeds too much that we've got to get out a little bit and get a different perspective and reread. I'm all about the, the classics right now because even the newer books had its roots in the classics. And yeah. Yeah. Well, success principles never change, you mm-hmm. know, things Zig Ziglar talked about and, um, you know, Schwartz and so forth. I mean, those things are tra- generational, you know, success, you know, there's no, anybody who says they have a, Oh, get rich quick. You know, it's, 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 you got to have those success triples, uh, principles in place. And one of those things is reading great books. I try to read a book a week if I can. And, and, and when I say read, I don't mean sit down, you know, like in the perfect world, like on Instagram, you know, with my coffee sitting there on a table, sitting out by the, the back window. I'm talking about if I'm, if I'm working out, I'm listening to an audio book. If I'm driving on a commute, I'm listening to an audio book instead of the news and all the negativities. So those are, those are ways that I, I find uh, time to consume those types of books. And, and it's easy to fit into your routine, you know, oh, turn off uh, who got kicked off the island this week and pick up a great book. <laughs> yes, definitely. Bachelorette well, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what kind of shows are on. I feel out of place. I, when somebody talks to me about a, a TV show, I just smile and nod. Oh yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm oblivious. Paul, it has been such a pleasure for you to take the time and um, be on today's show. I appreciate you being here and I would love for you to tell everyone how they can find you. Yeah, the best way is over at paulkline.net. So www.paulkline.net whatever, paulkline.net, Google it, it'll come right up. I've got some great resources there. I've got a free pricing quiz. So if you just want to kind of see if some of these things I've talked about uh, triggered, uh, you know, some interest to you and you're kind of curious of where, where you are, well, uh, the pricing quiz will walk you through. I, I think it was about 12 questions and then you'll get a rating and it ties back, which we didn't even talk about was to my hairband days. So based on your pricing answers, it will tell you whether you're a garage band or a headliner, you know, mm-hmm. Guns N' Roses or Led Zeppelin or something. So it has a fun theme to it. It's free. You can check it out. You don't even have to put your email in. If uh, You can just go there and it'll talk about retainers and things and ask you a series of questions. It's a great uh, tool for those that might be interested. And then of course, I would love for you to uh, subscribe to the Pricing is Positioning podcast right next to Gala's here and uh, a great complimentary p- podcast. Uh, so so, and that's called the Pricing is Positioning Podcast on Spotify, iTunes, and all that great stuff. So, paulkline.net and, um, and the podcast is great ways to connect with me. Excellent. Thanks so much, Paul, for being here. Thank you for having me. And you guys uh, keep uh, doing what you do and uh, having a great 2021. It's going to be a lot better. I know it will. Thanks for joining me today. Be sure to scroll down to the show notes and find the links not only to connect with Paul, but also the resources he mentioned. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you found this episode helpful, I do hope that you'll consider subscribing and even leave a review. Your feedback would be most helpful in getting this info out to others who it may help. I'd be honored if you'd share on social by doing a quick screen capture and sharing it on your favorite platform. And don't forget to tag me. Well, until next time, Have a fantastic week.